you may have heard of when people refer to the triple bottom line, um, which stands for people, planet, and profit. So of course, companies they want to make money, but at the same time, they don't want to harm the planet and they don't want to harm the people. Hello and welcome to Love as a Business Strategy, a podcast that brings humanity to the workplace. We are here to talk about business, but we want to tackle topics that most business leaders tend to shy away from. And we believe that humanity and love should be at the center of every successful business. As always, I'm your host, Jeff Ma, and I have a co-host today. Hello, Chris. How's it going? Chris Petrie. Hey, Jeff. Good to see you. Chris, you know, as well as anybody, you're a regular here that we love yeah. to have conversations and hear stories from real people and how, to, how real businesses work and real things in life. And uh, whenever you come to co-host, it's always for a very good reason. So I was hoping you could introduce our guest today. Sure, I would love to. So <clears throat> as I was sort of scanning through LinkedIn, you know, I love just like, you know, stalking, you know, people from <laughs> college and past lives that I've had. Um, and I saw this interesting article on Inc. Africa from one of my classmates. And I was like, holy crap, like, I want this guy on the podcast. And so without further ado, I invited Igosime uh, Oyofo, um, also called Ego. I call him Ego. <laughs> um, but we went to college together back at in the GW days. Um, he graduated in 2005. I graduated in 06. Um, and since then, I've just been following the life of an investment banker <laughs> for, uh, I'm not going to put the uh, number of years, it's almost 20, but <laughs> um, I've just been fascinated because it's the world that I personally didn't go into. But um, being in the business school, I was surrounded by so many finance majors. You like the way I said finance? <laughs> That's the way I was taught um, to say it. But um, it was such a pleasure to read that article and get a refreshing take because so often I don't get that perspective into investment banking and to see um, that article connect so much to what we've been talking about. I really wanted Ego to come and share some of that insight and perspective and get into ESG reporting and some of these other new trends inside of the, uh, the investment banking and finance industry. So that way we can dig into it and, and just open this conversation, you know, perhaps for the first time inside of uh, the financial uh, services community. But I'm, uh, again, going to stop and let Ego sort of share more about himself. But um, I just am so grateful and excited to be able to have this conversation, reconnect um, and have it be heard and or watched by all of our listeners and friends. Awesome. Welcome, Ego. Thank you, uh, Chris, for the great introduction. Thanks, Jeff. So yeah, uh, my name is Igo Simeonfo, Igo for short, like uh, Chris pointed out. Um, yeah, we, uh, I was in the class of 05, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, and yeah, I haven't seen Chris in a long time, but um, what I do now is, I mean, I moved back to um, Nigeria uh, late 2006, started my career in investment banking here in, in Nigeria in about two, early 2007. Um, and I've just, you know, been in this market, been in Africa for, for pretty much all of that. Spent some time in uh, Mauritius some years ago. Um, but really, most of my work has been focused on Nigeria, you know, a little bit of Ghana, some Kenya, um, and a couple of other countries as well. Um, so currently, I am an executive director at a UK-based boutique uh, investment bank called Lion's Head Global Partners. Um, what we do essentially is try and take a um, capital markets, innovative finance approach to um, basically sectors that are in need of a lot of development, you know, in, in, in the markets like Africa, you know, Middle East as well. Um, and really, it's just around, you know, affordable housing, um, agriculture, healthcare, education, etc. You know, um, if you're familiar with kind of deals that happen in Africa, you'll hear a lot of stuff that's happening in maybe infrastructure and telecoms and oil and gas, etc. You and, and you know, large scale financial services, but you won't hear as much in other um, sectors. So um, we take a very sort of innovative approach. Um, but what we try and do is also make sure we accomplish um, 
I guess, you know, you know, social and like environmental goals, you know, basically ESG, you know, there, there is a lot um, to that approach that is sort of um, embedded in our work. So, yeah, that's that's uh, that's kind of what I'm up to now. Um, yeah. Ego, if you don't mind me asking just just to set the stage here for everybody, can you define what ESG stands for and what it is for our listeners if they're not aware? Uh, great question. Um, stands for environmental, social, and governance. So it's really just, um, you know, there's two ways, I guess, to look at it, right? It's like, it's it's a discipline in of itself, i.e. looking at projects, companies, um, the way things are financed, etc., and saying, does it comply with certain ESG um, standards, you know, so with environmental, for instance, you know, you want to make sure that, you know, as much as possible, it's climate positive in the sense where, you know, you're, you're not, you know, having, um, uh, or you're, you know, reducing carbon emissions, or, you know, you're not uh, degrading coastline or whatever the case may be, uh, eroding coastline, excuse me, um, uh, if that's correct. <laughs> um, social, it's really just around the communities, the people, um, for instance, if you are uh, looking to set up a power plant, right, it's next to a community, you know, 30,000 people, et cetera, et cetera, you know, is, are there harmful chemicals or harmful byproduct that's going to affect people? You have to make sure that you you um, you cater for those people um, and, and, and um, the environment at large. And then um, on the governance side, it's really around your company, your project, but really around transparency. Are you run in the right way? Do you have stakeholders you're accountable to? Do you report on your activities? Um, that's a huge part of ESG, actually, particularly when it comes to the investing side of things. So it's really just um, something that's become embedded in a lot of business now in kind of making sure that everything we do has a net positive impact on a number of um, uh, kind of um, I guess in a number of areas, right? You may have heard of when people refer to the triple bottom line, um, which stands for people, planet, and profit. So of course, companies, they wanna make money, but at the same time, they don't wanna harm the planet and they don't wanna harm the people. So it's all sort of tending towards the same um, uh, direction. Awesome. You already gave me so much wisdom and I'm like, <laughs> we're just seven minutes in, eight minutes in. Um, no, but... I have a question because we've been, or I've been actually like getting really curious and interested in learning more about ESGs because there's so many existing organizations that have now started to, you know, create teams and processes to build out these reports. Um, many of which are either new to this practice, have never sort of done it before, um, but also are now having to scrutinize themselves to realize they're not compliant and a lot of <laughs> a lot of things that are, are expected. Um, so in your experience um, in Africa, UK, any market that you've been in, how do you help leaders of businesses understand one, the importance of ESG, but also when they realize they're not compliant, how like what's the ramifications what are the the lookouts or what are the motivators to get them compliant um okay so great question um it's it's still you know there's still a lot of progress that needs to be made i mean one of the aspects i didn't mention around esg because there's so much in each sort of bucket um mm -hmm. but around the socialist things around you know diversity equity inclusion, etc. Now, before we kind of formalize what ESG was, you know, about, you know, 10, 15 years ago, at the beginning of my career, um, there was a cognizance of, you know, for instance, like, you know, there weren't enough women represented on boards, right, in Nigeria, for instance, you know, where I am, um, you know, so that thing around leaning towards gender balancing was kind of starting to develop in people's minds. Now, with some people, you could have said, okay, you know, is it a little bit of tokenism or is it something where you're actually understanding that having women on your board actually leads to better outcomes from a business perspective, right? But that's sort of developed over time. Um, and now we've started seeing more of a formal E and G to join everything. Um, 
And so what we see now is, you know, a lot of companies. So, so basically an economy like Nigeria is made up of, I like to call it, um, so you have a lot of, you know, quite a number of large companies, but then there are so many smaller companies that, you know, kind of, you know, comprise this massive middle layer, which is why, you know, you see, oh, we have largest GDP in Africa, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, in that is like, you know, thousands and thousands of smaller companies that talk about, um, you know, like they're, they're all looking to make money, et cetera. But it's like each of them is sort of coming to their own realization of the importance of some of these things. So from a regulatory perspective, if you're doing like, you know, like an aforementioned power plant, or you're doing something like, um, uh, you're doing something in the telecommunication space or whatever, you know, there is an understanding that, right, you need an environmental safety impact assessment report, right? So that takes care of the E. Um, but it's still in sort of bits. There is some investor driven, um, I guess you could say progress or change. Um, for example, you know, um, there are certain investors that are out from outside of Nigeria that, or Africa that invest on the continent that insist on certain um, kind of metrics and uh, outcomes that they want to see as a condition of investing in whatever it is. So whether it's, um, you know, uh, maybe a bond and, you know, um, green bonds and sustainability bonds are starting to be something that um, is becoming more popular uh, on the continent. Um, so, you know, in a nutshell, we have basically, you know, progress towards the mean driven by different areas, right? So it's not like necessarily there's one thing that says, oh, you know, your ESG standards must be at this um, uh, level, but there is a general sort of market awareness and it's growing that ESG needs to be something that we take more seriously and incorporate into the mainstream. I mean, that's <clears throat> that sounds very like interesting when it comes to like the investors are like putting those requirements out there. And like that, oftentimes that is what it takes for some leaders to either get their heads and hearts in the right place. Um, and I know personally seeing so many, so many leaders who, who, who need, you know, that accountability in order to like launch into this or to take it seriously or to stay consistent in it. Um, and, you know, I'm curious in your, um, in these experiences and these stories, um, where does, I guess, education play a role, like going to business school? Where do, where do those sort of facets and funnels and, and, and channels go leading into sort of the pipeline of talent coming in? What are their roles or, you know, do you think that they have a role in this uh, conversation? Um, so as you know, as you may know, education is obviously a very important space in Africa because as Africans, we um, value education, but then at the same time, we don't have enough of it, right? Um, I think a statistic a long time ago was that uh, the tertiary um, uh, rate, i.e. The, the number of kids that actually get in the university in, in the continent is about 8%, which compared to about 24% in India, and, you know, 72% in the United States, etc. This is from a few years ago. Um, and this was something that, you know, um, I... Uh, you know, I worked, um, funny enough, at a, a company called Africa Leadership University. That was when I was in Mauritius um, and, you know, spent some time, you know, thinking about, you know, this issue and how to deliver um, education models that could help close that gap without necessarily having to go build, you know, 25,000 new universities around the continent. Um, but to answer your question more directly, I think it's a combination of things, right? Because... Um, I don't know necessarily that curricula has sort of caught up fully and you have, um, at least in the sort of university level and you have, you know, full on ESG courses, et cetera. I think there's just um, an awareness of changes that are happening from a cultural perspective, but also happening from an international perspective. Um, you may know that, um, you know, Africa, we have you know, a pretty decent sort of mobile and, uh, you know, mobile connectivity and internet connectivity um, uh, penetration rate. So, you know, we're very well exposed. Um, we're connected to things that are going on. And so we're seeing things that are happening, um, especially also when you look at social media, right? Um, 
we're seeing what's happening in the diversity and equity uh, and inclusion discussion. Um, and we're looking for ways to sort of incorporate that here. I think that, um, you know, we talk about these um, sort of millennial, Gen Z, Gen X, everything sort of divides, but I find that their generation, whether or not they get to, you know, finish university, because we're always having university strikes in Nigeria, right? Um, uh, they, they, they are already very aware, very clued into a lot of issues. And so what ends up happening is that they come into the workforce, whether it's interns or like, you know, junior employees, but they bring a lot of this understanding of some of the issues. Now, you know, we can go back and forth on, you know, how, what that means for like the culture of firms and, you know, how things have been and, you know, whether they're going to change, et cetera, but, you know, it's um it's an interesting balance but then i think you know when you think of business school it is something that is being discussed quite vigorously at different business schools around the continent you know i think um um you know they do a lot of the schools and the institutions do a really good job of trying to keep current with um some of these issues and also to um uh at least on the environmental side of things it's really important to consider that um, when you think of the effects of global warming, climate change, et cetera, Africa is going to be uh, or is already one of the hardest hit continents, and that's going to change unless we reverse it. So there's also that, um, again, increasing awareness to have a stake in trying to solve some of these issues, and it all just cuts across the board. Awesome. Jeff, I don't want to monopolize the, the conversation. So, do you have any questions for you? No, this is this is great. No, I I I am always curious about. I guess you know you're working in finance, obviously, an in investment. Um, but where does your personal kind of passion come from, and it, is that connect? Like, how does that relay into your work in ESG and things like that? Um. You know, I think just, um, you know, something when I step back and I look at, you know, the first sort of part of my career, and what I've been able to experience. And, you know, sometimes when you're working in finance and you're, you know, you're, you're neck deep in all kinds of transactions, there's documents flying all over the place, you're running helter skelter to get things done. Sometimes it's difficult to see the impact of the work you're doing. But then sometimes you get a chance to step back and be like, oh, wow, you know, I worked on that deal and this is what happened as a result, et cetera, et cetera. So I think seeing the tangible impact of some of that work has been very helpful in sort of helping, you know, to, to develop my passion. Um, I think also interacting with people directly, um, you know, throughout the course of my work, but also just, you know, personal side of things in my life, et cetera. Um, and just getting the chance to understand people's stories and understand, you know, certain things that happen to people and being able to, again, look at the impact of certain bits of work and how they translate into. Um, so I'll give you an example. Um, uh, quite a while ago, I worked on the first um, uh, municipal bond for a state called Lagos. Lagos is the biggest state um by population in the country uh, uh they say unofficially it's about 20 million people uh, i think officially it's it's much lower but uh, if you if you drive around lagos you'll you'll know there's quite a few people here um so what is that like nearly three times the size of uh you know new york city right but um but not the same land area at all but anyway um you know we we suffer from a lack of infrastructure in Africa, right? And so that bond um, that was raised um, was one of the first instruments that helped to go on and build a significant amount of infrastructure in the city, in the state. And one of those bits was a link bridge between, you know, two um, densely populated uh, uh, suburban areas, but it basically allows you to create another thoroughfare for uh, traffic. But the the net effect also included a bit of a bonus because now we have a sort of running and jogging culture that is really taken up like off because of that bridge. So you always have people going back and forth. And now 
because it's so nice looking, um, it, it has a sort of almost landmark effect and it's part of the Lagos skyline, right? So you've now got something that looks good. It serves a functional um, purpose from a traffic uh, uh, and mobility perspective, but it also encourages a certain amount of fitness and lifestyle. So, you know, and so like, you know, if I step back and I say, okay, wow. So the things I did years ago led to something that allowed a, a, a state to issue um, a, a, an instrument that allowed for those things to be created. So that's the kind of thing um, that I'm talking about that helps with, you know, helping to build up that passion. Um, as I said, far removed from the uh, world of finance, um, but it's really interesting to hear you, you know, sort of bring that closer to like reality in terms of what I see in terms of a bridge, you know, started years mm -hmm. before that bridge even got the, you know, commissioning mm -hmm. to get built. Um, and so as you look at, you know, the impact that, you know, finance has on everyday lives um, and now looking at, you know, the development of ESG reports and, and sort of um, these cultures inside of organizations, I'm curious to know, like, what what would you want to happen inside of the world of finance, culturally speaking, people impact wise, right? Because you guys do so much for everybody else, but you know, um, I'm just curious to hear, like, what would you love to see inside of the world of finance, you know, in terms of people impact? I mean, to be fair, not everyone will share that opinion that we've done so much for everyone else. <laughs> They'll probably think we've done the opposite. I'm just, I'm just saying we account, because man. I'm, right, I'm technically in the world of finance, but there's a lot of stuff that's happened that I'm far, far removed from. But, yeah. you know, I mean, just, you know, jokes apart. Look, I think from a cultural perspective, what would be nice to see? Um, it's, it's. Um, I mean, I, I think that there is, and you know, I guess this is synonymous with like the theme of you know your entire podcast, right? But I think there is a space for just a little bit more consideration around, you know, employees, employee welfare. And when I say that, I don't just mean like you know perks and giving people time off, etc. You know. Um, that's part of it. But really just trying to step back and look at the entirety of a person. I remember um, one of my first jobs, um, we had a, a, a company retreat and we were talking about, you know, ways to improve the company, et cetera. And I just, you know, raised my hand. I was young, I was like 24 or something. And I said some stuff around like basically um, thinking around ways to improve staff morale. Right. And they were like, oh, you know, sounds like a bunch of soft skills. And I was like, I mean, if you want to call them that, because it was the whole thing of like, oh, technical skills. Right. Oh, Excel, PowerPoint, Word, et cetera. And then on the other hand, it's like soft skills. Or it's everything from ranging from, you know, customer service uh, interactions, et cetera, to, again, the aforementioned time off and, you know, time to you know just unplug and stuff like that. And I got laughed out of the room, you know, because I'm just like, oh, yeah. And I was just like, okay, fine, whatever. But look now, right? Um, not only are we seeing um, increasing flexibility around, you know, sort of like you know, maternity and paternity leave, et cetera, um, even though the idea of paternity leave still gets laughed at. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, there, there is an improvement. But I still think that we have a little way to go because we, we still have not fully drawn the connecting line between uh, an employee's performance and sort of like their mental, you know, and emotional condition. Um, so even though I am, you know, you know, I've, I've worked as hard as, uh, you know, the, the, the rest of them, you know, I've been up there with the best. I've, I've had the super late nights, the super early mornings, um, you know, the last, last ditch flight, like, like last flight out of town <laughs> kind of thing to, to, to get that one, you know, document or approval or whatever the case may be. I don't mind the breakneck speed, but I do think we just need to be a bit more cognizant of the fact that we are people and we do from time to time need to sort of like take a step back. Um, and in some companies, we need to do a better job of sort of working into the schedule or the culture, deliberate ways to unplug or to socialize with each other and just kind of recharge the batteries. Good answer. 
Jeff, do you have a thought to that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm curious. I'm curious, like, you know, you made a, I guess, a joke about, you know, not everybody feels that way um, about finance and folks in that in that line of work. Um, do you see that, like, as a problem? And do you see that as solvable? Or do you see their opportunities for love to penetrate that arena or, or is greed just um, kind of <laughs> <laughs> you know it's interesting you say that right because to some extent you can look at what happened with the uh, 2008 you know the financial crash and everything you know um, subprime mortgages and greed played a big part there right but at the same time you look at the crypto world now and just the amount of value that has been lost in the last, I don't know, you know, three, four months or whatever. Um, and you can definitely see that greed was a part of it as well. Um, so I think it's not necessarily greed that's just, you know, um, attributed or attributable to just the finance world. I think it's just kind of, you know, human nature. What I think would help with finance is for those of us who are in the space, you know, we, you know, do a better job of going out of our way to sort of explain what it is we do, right? So the example of what I did to help, you know, create a bridge, create a piece of infrastructure that I drive over all the time and I don't even think about, right? Those are dots that you can connect for people to help them be like, oh, wow, you know, um, it's not just a bunch of greedy guys with briefcases and however, insert however many dollar value suits, right? running around and talking about things that don't make any sense, right? It's actually things that lead to significant outcomes. So, and on the one hand, yeah, so we don't do ourselves any favors in not being able to sort of relate with people um, and explain, so like, what are the implications of the um, the Fed's rate hike just yesterday, right? Um, what does it mean for the United States? What does it mean for Europe? What does it mean for Africa, et cetera, et cetera? Um, and so having more of us who just kind of take the time to say, hey, you know, well, this is what it is, et cetera. And you might want to consider this, you know, when you're thinking about your savings, any cash you have, any assets you have, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, yeah, that's my take there. Yeah, I appreciate that. And, you know, speaking statistically wise, we, we don't talk to a lot of bank, banking, financial folks here enough. And I know that. Yeah. I truly believe that, you know, love is a business strategy and just humanity can be found in every, in every avenue, in every arena. But I think there is something like to be said about kind of like greed being the enemy of love um, in, in, especially in business. And, yeah. you know, it's really, really encouraging to talk to you to, to kind of, you know, cause there's, there's, there's a human behind every, you know, every role and there's a story behind every human. And, you know, I, I, I always hope that we can, we can move forward in, in those spaces, not to generalize an entire industry or, or, or job, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, I, I, I selfishly and kind of, you know, always hoped to find more and more, you know, allies and advocates in that space because um i feel like it's where we need it the most in a way uh from my perspective yeah no absolutely i agree with that completely so count me as one going forward <laughs> nice <laughs> i will absolutely chris anything to say to your um your long long time friend before we <laughs> close out here no, I, I thank you, Je uh, Jeff, as well as Ego, for joining me and and having this conversation. Ego, I think, um, you know, I told the team I was like, "Hey, we need somebody from finance. Like, we need somebody from finance. Like, we we talked to so many different industries. We talked to a, a smaller bank a, a while back, um, uh, JMMB um, in Jamaica, um, but like investment okay. banking and that sort of that world." Um, I'll be honest, has typically not seen a lot of value in our message, mainly because, you know, it sometimes feels like a, a com competitor or a challenger to status quo. 
um, which yes, I'm sure it is. Um, but I just, I know that there are more of us um, <laughs> like you in that world who are looking at things and seeing things and either waiting for their turn to step in leadership and be able to show that, you know, <laughs> what has been doesn't have to be. Um, but I just thank you for coming and sharing your exactly. insight, your wisdom, um, and also your ability to emote and show that finance does have a place in all of our lives. Um, and, you know, just like with anything, its, in its impact can be positive or negative, but really um, it can be a tool regardless. So thank you. It, is, it was my pleasure. Thank you guys for having me. It was great to talk to you. and. We well, yeah, could have kept going, but uh, <laughs> you guys have important things to do. And it's uh, it's uh, nighttime over here in Lagos, so yeah. let's uh, let's uh, quit while we're ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I appreciate you making the time. Thank you uh, to Ego, Chris, for joining me, and thank you to the listeners, who, as always, know that we are putting out new episodes for you every week on Wednesdays and. We hope you have checked out our book, Love is a Business Strategy. If you haven't already, pick it up at Amazon and other retailers. And don't forget to subscribe and rate the podcast. Tell a friend um, and reach out with any thoughts, questions, love, support, feedback. So with that, thank you, everybody, and we'll see you next week.